Good afternoon and welcome to Early Modern Europe, our first lecture. And we are starting off in a very strange place now that we're getting used to the whole business of doing classes that are half online, half in discussion. Um, we may never actually see each other other than through um, our Zoom meetings or anything else like that. So welcome. I'm glad that you're a part of our class. I'm glad that we are going to be exploring what is a fascinating period of time in European history. A couple of housekeeping things just to get started. Please do look through the syllabus, read through it. If you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to get a hold of me. Um, the best way to do that is through my regular UDM um, email. So if you've got questions, let me know. Likewise, once you've looked at the syllabus, um, seeing what you need to do, make sure that you get the books that are required for this class. Those are particularly important. In fact, it's kind of tough to do it without. Um, and then go ahead and look at our discussion thread that is going on on Blackboard right now. So those are some basic housekeeping chores for us to do. Um, make sure that you are checking your email regularly because so much of our stuff is gonna be coming through that. So make sure that that all takes place, all right? Um, a very brief introduction. My name is Dr. Ken Grant. I have been teaching at the De University of Detroit Mercy for five years now. Heavens. Um, and before that, I was a history and religious studies professor at the University of Texas Pan American, now named the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Um, I have been doing this for quite some time, and I love teaching these classes, and so I'm glad that you're along with us for this particular journey. Interesting about this particular class is that its very title speaks to the fact that it's kind of a strange beast, right? Early modern Europe. Those three words really kind of make us scratch our head because it's very qualified, right? And so what I want to do today, what I want to do in this lecture today, is I want to talk about those three words. We need to be able to define those words so that the rest of the term makes some kind of sense. And you're thinking, okay, early modern Europe, I got that from the course title. Um, what's important for us to start with is that this is roughly around the year 1400-ish, to about the time of the end of the French Revolution, so around the year 1800-ish. Um, both of those two beginnings and endings are fluid, flexible, and it's gonna be important for us to recognize that that's true about all historical periodization. And what I mean by that is we then tend to take all of human history and we start to separate it down into more manageable chunks. And so the major three that we talk about are ancient, medieval, and modern, all right? Now, within those broad classifications, within those broad periodizations, we start to you know, bring them down even smaller. And then we start thinking about not only time, but geography. And so we can talk about ancient Mediterranean history. That's what I, one of the other classes that I teach, the ancient Mediterranean world. Well, that's a very specific time and a very specific place. And so it's important for us to recognize that both time and geography make a difference on what we're studying. It's helpful because it tells us what we are going to study, and it also tells us what we are not going to study. And those distinctions all make a difference, right? In history, we can teach ancient, medieval, or modern. In all of those that we can look at particular geographies, so Mediterranean or European, African, Asian, South Asian, um, American history, all the rest. These are choices that we make 
so that we can bring this huge sweep of the human story down into something that's a little bit more manageable. That's what all history classes do. That's what all history is, right? This is really just the story of human beings over time and all the things that we've done, all the ideas that we've had, the places that we have gone, the encounters that we have had, both good and bad for all of those things. And so history is the human story. And what we are going to be focusing on in this class is a very particular part of that much broader human story. And so we bring it down into these three distinctive um, categorizations of doing the broader thing of history, and that is early, modern, and Europe. And so let's take a look at each of these three words, and you're thinking, oh my goodness, we're never going to get through class if it's going to take you a full lecture just to get through three words. I promise this will speed up as we go along and we'll get into the broader topics, but this is really important. Defining your terms is one of the most important things that you can do, not just in history, but in every class. If you know what the words are that you're using, you are pretty far ahead of just about everybody. And so I appreciate your willingness to kind of chug through this one bit at a time. So we begin with early. Early is a term coined, and especially early modern, is a term coined by European historians, people who study Europe, right, to denote a very specific period of time. And we're really, again, roughly talking 1400 to 1800 CE. Um, that's the common era. Now, you may have heard periodization talked about in the years that we talk about as, say, 1400 AD. We don't use that terminology for a very simple reason. Um, if you say this is the year 2020 AD, AD is Latin, which stands for Anno Domini, or the year of our Lord. Well, the Lord in this question is very specifically Jesus of Nazareth, and they're saying that this is dependent upon a Christian interpretive lens. We instead will use the terminology that is, this is 2020 CE, 2020 of the Common Era. Now, why do we do that? Well, very simply put, not everybody's Christian, and not everybody uses the same calendar, and so we are going to use the one that is most generally acceptable. And yes, it happens to be the same one that the Christians use, but we take that interpretive lens off so that we can see more broadly and understand that history is not seen through just one interpretive lens. There are many of them, and each and one of us has a series of interpretive lenses through which we see history and interpret history. But if we can take off some of those lenses, it benefits all of our explorations. So between 1400 CE and 1800 CE, that's generally understood to be the early modern period. Now, we use the word early because early implies that it is a time of transition. Early means that we're going from something old into something not as right? And so it implies movement. It implies a time of transition. It implies that European history has changed at that particular moment in a way that is unique, new, innovative, different, right? All history is an exploration of change and continuity. But what we're looking at in this particular period of time is a very distinctive period of significant and sometimes radical change. All right? So it implies a time of transition. That's the first one. The second one is it's perceived as something categorically different than that which preceded it. 
i.e., this is no longer medieval Europe. And here's the interesting thing. All periodizations are interpretations in the first place. And the people who called themselves, you know, modern, were distinctly trying to say, but that makes us different than those people, those people living back in the medieval period. And the first culprits, and I use that word very much on purpose, the first culprits for saying that they lived in a different time than those medieval people were the folks who we call, um, who were alive at the time of the Renaissance, right? Now, here's the thing. The dirty little secret of the Renaissance is that it's during the Middle Ages, the medieval period. Um, they were trying to differentiate themselves from a period of time that they really wanted to pretend never happened. Because medieval simply means middle age or the middle ages. And that has a very interesting implication. Well, the middle of what, right? Well, it's the middle between us in the modern period. You know, we are so um, educated and civilized and all the rest. And then there was the Middle Ages, which nobody wanted to talk about during the Renaissance, even though they were definitely in the Middle Ages still, right? And the ancient world or the classical period, the time of ancient Rome and then ancient Greece, when civilization was flourishing around the Mediterranean and all was right and proper and there was nothing but sunshine and daisies and unicorns as far as the Renaissance scholars were concerned. So you can see it's a matter of interpretation, right? And this is really something particularly important. And so when historians look at it and they're doing their periodization or putting boundaries around the categories that they want to explain, and they say, ah, the early modern period, what they're trying to say is that it's different than what had come before during the medieval period. And so they give it a new name and they give it a new category and they try to say this is completely different because in many cases, what they're saying is that they were embarrassed about the things that happened during the Middle Ages, right? And you're thinking, this is all very complicated. It's not as complicated as that because very simply stated, they're trying to differentiate themselves from a time which they say we have now grown out of. And so historians and the kind of professional historians that we're thinking about, the ones who are evidence-based and using kind of a scientific method for getting to the information by looking at sources and being critical of all of this kind of stuff, um, by means they're, they're really looking at the text, they're being very careful about context and setting and language used and all that other kind of good stuff. That really didn't start until about the 19th century. That's when um, what we would call scientific historical inquiry really began. And the last thing they wanted to do was to say that they were like the people back there in the Middle Ages, right? And so they start coming up with these periodizations. And the first one they come up with, well, there's the ancient world, right? And then there's the medieval world, which we're no longer a part of, and then the modern world. Well, once you start looking at the modern, the farther you get away from whatever that modern period supposedly starts, you're going to have to put those into smaller categorizations too. And so we get early. Okay? And you're thinking, holy cow, Dr. Grant, I mean, honestly, you just spent 10 minutes on one word. That seems excessive. It may feel excessive, but I really want you to see that we've got to be careful and we want to unpack these things because we're going to be handling some pretty heavy topics, right? We're going to be talking about revolution. We're going to be talking about technological innovation. We're going to be talking about the birth of European racism against other parts of the world. And so, yeah, we have to be careful. We want to be specific and we need to be able to define our terms. And that starts right 
now. And so while this may seem excessive, it's necessary, right? And so I want you to kind of wrap your brains around how important these terms actually are. All right, so that's early, right? We understand essentially that it's periodization, categorization, and it's distinctly trying to draw a line between something old, right, and something past, even farther deep, and then something that's new. All right, so modern. Modern is very much a specific, distinctive idea that carries all sorts of interpretive um, baggage along with it. And so there's a couple of things that we assume go into this basket that we're calling early modern period. And a couple of them is our an exploration of intellectual development and intellectual expression that is different than what we are going to see during the medieval period. Now, I'm going to explain some of these things as we get into our first few additional lectures. And so I'm just going to give you the terminology now, and we'll start to unpack that over the next few weeks. So there's an intellectual development and evolution that is definitely taking place during the first part of the early modern European period. And yes, that does definitely include this thing that we call the last vestiges of the Renaissance. The Renaissance lasts for quite some time, and it encompasses a great many things, but one of the most important component parts of it is its intellectual development. And so we're going to talk about that as we go along. The other component, or one of the other components, so intellectuals first, the second one is a moral component in which they really start to explore at a deeper level the ethical questions that have been frankly discussed since the very beginning of all of human civilization and even before then. Moral questions are significant and in the early modern period, they're going to be taking on a new tone and a new tenor and a new exploration. They are not actually new questions. They are going to be explored in new and evolved ways. All right, a couple of other things. So intellectual, moral. The next one is a very clear embrace of experimental science. Now, you ask yourself, were there scientists in the ancient and the medieval worlds? Absolutely. There are scientists all over the place. But did they have that same kind of rigorousness in their methodology that we are going to see develop in the late Middle Ages and into the early modern period? Not as much. Because this is when we're going to really start to move towards this notion of experimental science and experiment the word itself is particularly important because the root of experimental is experience. And one of the most fundamental notions of experimental science is, can you do that same experience over and over and over again and get the same results if you have the same criteria to start? And that if you change something, will you get a new result? So experimental science, we'll talk about this as we go along, especially when we're looking at the development and the long history of the scientific revolution, which takes place during this particular period of time. All right, the next one is political freedom. Now, political theory is a fascinating and important conversation throughout this entire period because people are going to be pushing the boundaries of what it means to be political animals in the early modern period in ways that they had not fully expressed before this, right? Now, it's really important, though, once again, to recognize, were there political theorists during the medieval period? Yeah, some really good ones. And they were drawing on the stuff that the political theorists and the political um you know, creators of the early modern period were doing back to the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans. But 
all of those things are going to be fed through that long history of what's going on in the human story and the exploration of our political realities, how we deal with one another in common groups, how we deal with the function of the state, the levels of individual and corporate freedom within that larger polity, all of those things are being explored all through the Middle Ages, but they're going to really take a significant leap forward during the early modern period. And we're going to explore not only what those ideas are, but why they happened, because that's just as much of an important focus. All right. And so that's the notion of political freedom, this notion that we're going to be growing and evolving these political systems. They are not something that is just created ex nihilo, out of nothing. They don't just emerge as if somebody had a bolt from the blue and they're like, aha, it's this break. No, it's evolution more than revolution. And that's particularly important. And we're going to see that through the long stretch of history. Are there revolutionary moments? Yes. But the whole thing you have to see revolutions, even revolutions within the context of what's going on at the time. Speaking of revolutions, it's not just a political freedom that's being expressed at this time. It's also a theological freedom, right? And that's something that's particularly important because one of the big stories that we're going to have smack in the middle of this period of time is the Protestant Reformation and the Catholic Church's response to the Protestant Reformation right? That's a big story right in the middle of it. And then after the Reformation, we're going to get the period of time that we call the period of religious wars. And then the reaction to all of that, which is the Enlightenment, right? We've got a lot of balls that we're putting up into the air all at once. And so theological freedom is going to be one of those areas that we explore. Now the next one, the next one is a fascinating conundrum because we're still, we're going to be really starting to see the development and the exploration and the evolution of personal identity and individualism, right? And if there's a thing that is the most prevalent characteristic of modern United States, right, of the modern United States, it's our understanding or our belief that the individual is sacrosanct. The most important thing is my ability to live and say and do and express myself how I want. The individual um, essentially is far more important than the community, right? And the rise of that notion, the rise not of individuals, because everybody was an individual, we always been, everybody's got agency, right? But the celebration of individualism, that's going to be something that we're going to see starting in the early modern period. And then finally, this notion of modern revolves around the unprecedented technological change innovation of this period. There's always been technological innovation and change, but never as fast never as fast as when it was during this particular, and we've not slowed down since. And so it's really the moment when we just slammed our foot to the gas on technological innovation and change. And we believed, and we started to turn our around on the notion that change is a good thing. Because in the medieval period and in the ancient world, change was always something to be leery of, suspicious maybe even a little bit, because change meant differences. And for people who are in positions of power, change means I might go down a few pegs, right? But even for people who are on the bottom of society, change often meant that things got worse. And so in the early modern period, we're going to start to start, we're going to start thinking about change as a positive thing, right? 
if things are going to get different, then they could change for the good, for the betterment of all of us, right? But in order to make that case, you have to show that change actually is a good thing, that it is a positive thing. And that's going to take some doing, right? Because most people, they're like, well, at least this is the devil I know. And if you change things, well, then I, don't, I have no idea what's going to happen. But people assumed if it was going to change, it wasn't going to get better. Because as far as they were concerned, it didn't. Things didn't get better, right? When they changed, they got worse. They either lost more power or more land um, or voice or life itself. So those are some things. Now, we've got a couple other um, components that we need to talk about, and that is there's a functionalist sociological definition of modern. Functional sociology, um, it's one of two perspectives of macro sociology. And you're thinking, uh, Dr. Grant, this is a history class. Why are we talking about sociological terms? Very simply put, history is the most interdisciplinary um, discipline on the college campus, period. We have to talk about everything right? We're going to talk about science. We're going to talk about theology. We're going to talk about history. We're going to talk about mathematics. We're going to talk about sociology. We're going to be talking about art. We're going to be talking about all these other kinds of things. There's not a discipline in the college, on, the, on a college campus, that historians don't need to explore at some point in time, right? Because we're talking about the human story. How can we not talk about all these other disciplines? And so history, by its very nature, is interdisciplinary, right? Which is why it's good that we're not all history majors in this class. It's why it's good that non-history majors are forced into taking history classes because every person in this class, regardless of what your major is, you've got an entry point into this period of time by your major or by your interests. That's just the way that works, all right? So, I need to talk about this functionalist sociological definition of modern because it helps uh, shape things a little bit. So the functionalist perspective of macro sociology is that it views society as composed of different parts working together. You're thinking, well, that just sounds like life, Dr. Grant. Well, that's what sociologists do. They look at how our life works and how it all hangs together. And so think of society as composed of different parts, different things, working together. And that's that working together that makes the functionalist perspective. Whenever you hear about these various groups or various parts of society or various things working together, that's a functionalist approach to sociology. Now, in contrast, there's the conflict perspective, right? The conflict um, sociological approach, and that is it views societies composed of different groups and interests that are competing for power and resources. So the functionalist approach says we're trying to figure out how these things work together. The conflict perspective says um, how do these different groups compete for power and resources? Okay, um, I tend to be a functionalist, not a conflict perspective. And so the functionalist approach for me is, I think, um, well, it sits more within the way in which I interpret um, history and the world itself. And so from the functionalist approach of sociology, there are some things very specific about the early modern period that are particularly important for us to kind of get into our heads as we get started. The first is this, that religion is a lifestyle choice. It's not an inescapable and uniform discipline. It's not a thing that you do, right? It's not something that just emerges from your being. It's something that you choose to participate in. Right? And it's the difference in many ways between most indigenous religions, which you could almost call 
medieval religion, um, which is an amalgamation of Christianity and a lot of other um, local religions. Um, there's no such thing as something that's purely a religious experience, right? Christianity is shot through the lens of all sorts of different religious experience. So is, is Islam and Judaism and Hinduism and Buddhism and all of the major world religions. They are shot through with the ideas of other religious experiences, right? It's an amalgamation, no matter what, right? Um, but in the modern world, that religious um, expression and articulation is not something that is just simply born from the things that everybody does, but it is decisions that have been made about how we are going to live. And religion becomes one of those choices that we then inhabit and embody. But make no mistake, that was, there was a decision somewhere in that, in our, in our lives. All right, so that's one. Second one is that belief in science has supplanted belief in active spirits or miracles. It used to be that some people looked at the world and they say, well, that's the, that's the spiritual world at work. Those are the powers and all the rest. And that when things happen dramatically, those are miracles right? There is a supernatural explanation. In the early modern period, we're really moving to away from that notion and towards a notion that science has all the answers. Now, the interesting thing is that science does become, in many ways, a faith system, right? How many people can actually explore effectively how things work scientifically. We appeal to that all the time. Well, that's just science. But do you know how it works? If you had to, right, could you tell me how my cell phone works, right, in detail? Could you fix it if it broke? If not, if you can't explain it, if you don't know the scientific understanding behind it, right? It's a magic box. It's all it is. So is this computer, right? It's a magic box. I turn it on, I ask it to do things, and lo and behold, it does what I want, right? Many people have gotten to the point where they simply assume that these things happen will be, well, science, it explains it, right? That's an important thing. Science as a belief that is just as strong as a belief in supernatural, religious, mystical experiences, right? And we have to be very careful not to say, well, see, I, I'm a modern person, and I believe in the principles of scientific inquiry, really, all the time, do you? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about modern. We just replaced one thing with the other. All right, a couple of other things that are just components of this uh, functionalist sociological definition of modern. Um, so there's religion and then there's science. And then there's the next one, that consumer goods are now mass produced rather than craft produced in households. It used to be that whatever you had, somebody made in your household, whatever clothes that you wore, the furniture, the stuff that you've got, right? Um, you, you either knew the person who made it or you figured out how to make it, right? And that's everything, including all the food that you ate from, you know, from beginning to end, from birth of an animal to the time when you butcher it and you put it on the table, and then you use all the other stuff. In the medieval and ancient world, that stuff is produced at home. In the early modern period is when we see the movement towards consumer goods being mass produced. You're saying, but yeah, they, they produced all sorts of things in the ancient world that they would barter and sell and trade and all that kind of good stuff. Yes, 
Yes, they did. But everyday stuff, most of that stuff made it home, right? So next, um, that fossil fuels um, and electricity will supplant power from muscle, water, wood, dung, and tallow, right? Those used to be, the, that's where energy came from. Us, a beast, or water, wood, dung, right? You don't need me to, you know, and tallow, which is fat. In whatever form that is, that could be olive oil, it could be animal fats, could be other vegetables, right? But make no mistake, when we move from using that as our um, power sources to fossil fuels, which is a strange thing, and electricity, and see, and now we're actually going backwards in a little way because we use the sun and wind again. People used to do that all the time, right? Because they're renewable, right? You don't have to, don't, you don't have to go out and get them. That's why water is such an important thing for say hydroelectric dams and all that kind of stuff. But we use it to transform it into other kinds of energy. All right, two more things in this sociological approach to the modern world, and that's transportation is by engine rather than by wind or animal power, right? By the time we get to the end of our class, we're gonna be talking about steam engines. Right, the Industrial Revolution. That's another one of our revolutions that we're going to, or one of those changes that we're going to be talking about. We're going to use an engine that's powered by some other resource other than wind or animal power or ourselves. You know how people used to get around to just everywhere? They walked, right? Farm work was done by hand. Maybe you had animals to pull your plows, right? If there was a competition just on everyday people of strength, I would pick a medieval farmer over just about anybody, right? A medieval farmer who doubles usually as the front line on the military for armies and stuff like that, that person, right, is going to have greater strength than you or I even after however many days or weeks or years of working out in the gym. Just the way it is. All right, last one. Government is designed by human beings to meet perceived needs rather than accepted as sanctioned by immemorial tradition. Let me say that one again. Government is designed by human beings to meet the needs of the community rather than something that's simply handed down from on high because tradition says that's the way we do it, right? We're going to move away from monarchy that is based on divinity. Why are you king? Well, because God said I'm king. And that's all you get. That's not the way we work. And that's going to be one of those big changes that we're going to be exploring as well. One of the best ways to think about the notion of um, monarchy as being divine right is look up the constitutional peasants scene in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, right? Look that one up, watch it. If you've never seen it before, watch the whole movie. But the constitutional peasants from Monty Python and the Holy Grail will give you as good of a sense of this, um, the sanction by immemorial tradition as you could possibly get in just a delightfully um, sarcastic way. It's just perfect, right? Um, and the best thing about the guys from Monty Python is that they were all history majors. See, you didn't think it was valuable. So now's the time to start thinking about history as your second major if you haven't already signed up. All right, so that's early and modern. Now let's do Europe. And you're thinking, well, this one's easy. It's just geography. Well, it is geography. We're talking about a very specific part of the map, essentially starting at the northern part of the map. Um, if we want to think about it, we would think about 
the um, Scandinavia, British Isles, down through what we would call continental Europe, um, and that sometimes reaches as far out as Moscow, right? And then all the way down to what we would call the, the Northern Mediterranean. So Italy, Spain, France, all into the Balkans, all of that. That's what we're talking about. But here's the interesting thing, is that that notion of Europe as a consolidated reality, right? And I'm going to put up a, an old map, right? That's what we think of when we think of Europe, right? Um, it's an interesting thing is that they didn't see themselves as quote unquote Europeans until frankly the modern period. Why? Well, they didn't even think of themselves as say French or Spanish or Italian or anything like that up until probably the Middle Ages. And even Italy doesn't even exist as a country until the 19th century, after we're all done, right? And so the question is, because they saw themselves as the citizens of city-states or of an empire, like the Roman Empire. And notice that, that's the Roman Empire, that's not Europe, right? And, be, and then after the Roman Empire, it's the Carolingian Empire. And so they would see themselves as component parts of whoever was in charge. That was never Europe as an institutional body, right? There's no such thing. It's a collection of peoples and places. All right. But the word Europe, right, it actually emerges from a very interesting thing because it's, you see... Back a long time ago in the ancient world, this is how they saw the map, right? Just like this. I got to get my angles right. So that, that, this is called the TO map, right? And there it is. It's a fascinating thing, but you'll notice something very particular about it. There are only three continents that are named Asia, Europa, Africa, right? And so the question is, where do these words come from? Well, specifically, dealing with these known territories, and you're thinking, well, wait a minute, that whole map is, is positioned wrong, right? Its perspective is wrong, right? Well, actually, no, because it's facing east. You'll notice at the um, top there, Oriens, that's east, and Occidens down here, that's west, um, a map, and this was drawn during the um, early medieval period, was drawn like this because you oriented everything to the east because the European who wrote this or drew this was a Christian, and so they focused on the most important thing, which was to the east of Europe, and that's called Jerusalem. Uh, it's the whole Christian thing again, right? That's where Jesus was... Um, the whole story revolves around Jesus of Nazareth and that perspective. And so that's the map, right? Because the most important thing is at the top of the map, which is pointing to the east, right? These things get confusing. Nonetheless, all right. So, but the notion of where the word Europe actually comes from may go as far back as the ancient Mesopotamians, right? So we're talking about 2000 BCE before the Common Era. So from our perspective, about 4,000 years ago, at minimum, the Mesopotamians spoke the language of, um, the, of Akkadian, right? That was their language. And what's really interesting is that we may start to see the glimmer of where these words come from. Because their word for sunrise was Asu, or Asu. Asia, right? And so that, of course, is to their east. And so they call it sunrise. To the west, for sunset, the Akkadians had a word, and it was Arabu or Arabu, Europe. And so Europe meant sunset. Asia meant sunrise to the 
Akkadian-speaking Mesopotamians, and the word probably stuck, right? And it starts to filter through all of the various languages, and we get in American English, Europe, right? Now, we see it starts in the time of Acadia, or the Mesopotamian speaking Akkadian, but it filters through the Greeks. And we get some stories about Europa, right? And you can see right there up on my little TO map, um, Europa. Europa was, in Greek mythology, one of the minor lower deities. She was a sea nymph, a minor ocean goddess, right? Europa was also identified as a precursor to Demeter, who is an earth fertility goddess. Um, in fact, some of the earliest Greek mytholog mythological collections talk about Europa instead of Demeter, and we actually see a transition taking place. One of the most well-known stories of the goddess Europa, or the person Europa, Europa was the daughter of King Aginor of Phoenicia, right? And she was young and beautiful, as always these stories go. And Zeus, right, the rather caddish um, head of Mount Olympus and the Olympian gods, um, he saw her and she caught his fancy, and so he wanted to spirit her away. And she, he knew that he was going to have to do this in a very creative fashion because she was also highly suspicious of the gods, which was really good thinking because you didn't really want the gods messing around personally in your lives. It didn't usually mean that good things were going to happen. And so he turned himself, transformed himself into a beautiful white bull, right? Right? And then all of a sudden meandered into and in the area where she was, she was on the shoreline and with her friends and they're having this big thing. And all of a sudden, out of seemingly nowhere comes this white bull. And it was impressive and beautiful. And she starts, she and her friends start hanging garlands of flowers on it. And then finally, it kneels down right in front of her, beckoning her almost to get up on this bull. And she does, which was a spectacularly dumb idea, right? So she gets on the bull, and it immediately starts trotting off right into the ocean, and it swims away, and it swims off to this remote island. And so she's been abducted by Zeus, right? And they get to this island, and Zeus transforms himself into his most handsome godlike form. And of course, she falls head over and heels in love with him. Probably not, but you know, this is the way these stories work. And she bears him three sons, Minos, Serpedon, and Ranamanthus. And these three, after they die, become the judges of the underworld. It's great stuff, right? And you're thinking, what does that have to do with a land? Nothing. It's just a word that was used to name these various goddesses, and it's stuck, right? Because of essentially where she was from, which was far and away off to the north and to the west. And so Europe is simply, well, this, right? This thing that we see, these collection of peoples and then later nations. And the reason we call it early modern Europe is because we're confining ourselves to dealing with these people, right? I got to get my perspectives all set up, right? We're dealing with the people from those places and their experiences and their um, encounters with the broader world. And so that's why we're looking at this. So why do we call this class early modern Europe? Well, because those are the three components of the things that give us the categorization to give us a nice bite-sized chunk of history to deal with. And we are going to be talking about some spectacularly important things. We're going to be starting off with the age of exploration and exploitation when those people 
start to see a much broader world and how they're going to encounter it and how they're going to react to it. Um, long story short, not all of it's very good, right? But we're also going to be looking at things like the Renaissance and the Reformation, the Scientific Revolution, the Industrial Revolution. We're going to be looking at various reformations of state and church. We're going to be looking at the reactions to some of these major events like the Enlightenment. And yeah, we're going to be talking about the building of some interesting national narratives of the English Revolution. And yes, we will end this whole semester with the French Revolution. And shot through the whole thing, we're going to be looking at the way in which society was changing just like that. Because all of a sudden, one of the most important things about this time period is that for these people, the world's going to get a lot bigger. Almost overnight, the world's going to get a lot bigger. I mean, honestly, we're going to start with this when they thought that there were only three continents. By the time we are said and done, they will know about all seven of them. Right? They will have circumnavigated the globe before we even get halfway through this class. Things are going to change. And we're going to focus on that sense of change and continuity. How do things evolve and what actually spins into what we would call a revolution? So we're going to be focusing on the things that are same, the things that are different, and by compartmentalizing, by categorizing as we have done, we're going to give ourselves the golden opportunity to actually wrap our brains around all of this. And then, and then, and this is the most important thing, everything that we study then has an impact on how we look at the world. We are the children of the early modern period. We are the children of the scientific revolution. We are the children of the enlightenment. We are the children of all these political and religious revolutions. We are the children of technological change and innovation. We are the children of a world that is sped up beyond our imaginings. And we are the children living through a pandemic, just like they did, time and time and time again. And there's not a pandemic that does not change the world and the way people look at it. We are living through one of those things that happened a lot during the early modern period. And we have to ask ourselves, What's going to happen to us? How are we going to be changed? What evolution will we see? What revolutions will we see? Because of what we are living through right now. And we're not going to know right off the bat. We're not going to be able to even see it until years later. Maybe even decades. We live in a time of change. Technology, politics, religion... Science, medicine, philosophy, sociology, history. So buckle up. This is going to be a spectacular semester. I am looking forward to everything that we are going to do. I look forward to your questions. Write them down. When you're looking at the videos, you know, looking at my lectures, when we're having our conversations, bring questions because I am going to be able to do so much more for you when you ask questions. So don't be shy, right? Write them down. And we will go oftentimes in our discussions where those questions lead us. Keep up with your reading. Um, there's a lot that you're going to be looking at. Um, the textbook is, it's a textbook, but it's going to fill in a lot of gaps. Think of it as a complementary piece to these lectures and to our discussions. And everything else that we read is going to help us flesh out this period of time. And we're going to go from something that feels like it could be just very two-dimensional and flat into something that looks a lot like, well, life. Our lives. 
and we're going to look at the things that have changed. And we're going to look at the things that are the same. And we're going to realize that this is just a chapter of the long human story. I can't wait to see what happens next. Thanks so much, everybody. I look forward to seeing you next time. I will, of course, make sure to let you know when I post my next lecture and when we set up our first Zoom or Google Meets um, discussion opportunity. But get going on our discussion thread. If you've got questions about this video, let me know, and then we will do this again very soon. So thank you. I'm glad that you're in class, and I look forward to seeing you next time.